And then a little bit of a, a approach and, and product and technology selection. Certainly a lot of practical uh, issues in making that decision. A little bit about the database design, very little, just one or two things, although those you can kind of get into the weeds when you talk about them. But, um, and then uh, finally about the ETL, uh, which when we talk about data marts or data warehouses or anything that involves sucking data out of different places and bringing them into one is a very important part of the whole, uh, part of the whole picture. The context or, or our project is really broad and, and so the solution I'm going to be talking about is, is, is pretty big and ambitious. Um, I, I probably bigger than you would consider or need, but I, I think that a lot of what we'll talk about would and does make sense, even for a very small, small scale implementation, even to the extent of maybe just the reporting table. Some of these issues make sense. So I, I think there'll be a value to you. Um, and I encourage questions as we go along. I think that probably makes more sense than holding them, uh, holding them until the end. And then I apologize if we do have a lot of questions and they drag on if I push you aside just to, so we can make some progress. Um, so the general context, just so you understand where we're coming from, we, we, we are working with a couple of schools on what we call uh, a business intelligence project. And that's, uh, it's very broadly defined business intelligence. So we're not, we're not talking about technology and tools per se. A lot of people equate BI with analytics, with analytic tools, with data visualization, dashboards, et cetera. We're, we're really approaching this from a much higher level perspective, which is we want to provide better, more effective management information to the people who, who need them, to the board, to the president, to the vice presidents, and directors of development, et cetera. And a lot of that involves doing analysis, doing queries, uh, trying to get a better handle on what's going on with your donors, with your prospects historically, and maybe projecting forward. And then perhaps writing reports and providing dashboards that utilize that information in that context. So we need to do a lot in order to do that, but the ultimate objective is, is much, uh, much higher level. Um, the sort of requests or questions that we get, and so these are, these are in quotes because these are specific um, uh, uh, you know, requirements uh, that we've gotten from either um, the people we're participating with or others in the industry, frankly, are things like um, a desire for more fact-based decision making, so that's essentially what I just uh, spoke to, uh, the ability to do forecasting a little more specific, supportive analytics and modeling, so that's kind of at the high level. Um, but then we get more specific requests which speak to the delivery of information. And so that goes a little bit beyond analyzing data to actually the mechanics of delivering it, which is a desire for more contemporary look and feel relative to what people were doing before, um, uh, given their tool set, given where they've come from, given what they do. Uh, more effective visual presentation, or I mean, let me, let me restate that, more effective visual presentation of information, where perhaps before there were a limited number of graphs used uh, a lot of dense, uh, perhaps, reports with uh, rows and columns of numbers, and they really want to get the message across more effectively by using uh, uh, various types of uh, uh, graphs or other visual techniques. And then, again, this is pretty specific, but uh, web-based access to the information, uh, email push. Um, then we get down to specific technological requests, uh, more contemporary technology, um, more cost-effective approach to delivering information. This becomes more of a practical issue. And then consolidation of multiple technologies and consolidation of satellite databases. So we're kind of all over the place. Related requirements, related requests, they all deal with what we're doing. They all deal with reporting. They all deal with provision of information. But they go beyond simply doing a good job of understanding the data and pre presenting information back to people. We're also being re requested or required to deal with a lot of practical issues, um, specifically, you know, more effective, uh, more cost-effective. Maybe that is probably the more important one there, and a desire to use more contemporary technology. So, just quickly, um, we're talking about context. So these are the sorts of things we've done. This is an example of Williams College's uh, solution at the moment, uh, or their, or their various dashboards and reports and so forth that, that we've developed over the last couple of years. Um, off to the right, we have the big yellow box, which represents data that we somehow need to 
get access to and utilize for the stuff off to the left. Starting at the bottom, uh, that, that sea of smiley faces represents basically their alumni body. So there are about 20, over 25,000 alumni who have access to reports and dashboards through their web community, through their web interface that the, the university or the college provides. Um, authenticated, they have to log on, so each, everybody is, uh, is uh, individually identified. And so there are a series of reports and, or dashboards or dashboards-like things available to uh, the entire alumni body. So that's over 25,000 users. Then there are over 1,600 volunteers who get a much richer set of reports and dashboards um, available uh, when they log on through, the, through their web application and also pushed out to them periodically uh, via email. Um, in addition to that, uh, Williams has, well, Williams only has about 25 plus staff. The 250 represents larger institutions um, who uh, use a different set of dashboards, um, different orientation, much richer, obviously full detail. Um, for uh, support of the annual giving programs, for support of prospect management, uh, forecasting, and so forth. And then there are a relatively small number of users of another, other sorts of applications. Um, and these are the power users that are doing, doing the analytics, doing ad hoc queries, uh, maybe writing reports uh, using a variety of tools that we don't necessarily prescribe. Um, so that's the context, now all of these tools, environments, and sets of users obviously need access to data in somehow. So in terms of context, we've got really broad, broad needs. So we're, this is not a point solution where we are, are providing a very specific sort of reporting solution or a specific set of reporting structures to support um, you know, analysts or even volunteers. We're, we've got a lot of different needs and we're really not interested in building a lot of different databases in order to support that. So one of the requirements then is a comprehensive scope of data. So um, given the sorts of dashboards we provide that go all the way down to drilling down on an individual and seeing the activities they've participated in, the individual gifts they've given, et cetera, um, we really need all the data in order to do this, not just for the analytical support, but just for, even for display. Um, because it's, nothing is more frustrating, I think, to an end user is to provide them information and say you've got six prospects who are rated at this level and not given the ability to drill down and see who the six are, or for that one prospect then on that list of six to be able to drill down and see what the status of that proposal is, and then, oh, did that gift come in yet? And have they been on campus recently? To have to step away from your reporting or your dashboard environment to someplace completely different to get that information. So we really need all the data. So this is a comprehensive um, scope in terms of the data items that we're dealing with. Um, consequently, what you need is obviously very effective communication or integration of whatever your reporting solution is that's supporting something like this with the sources of data, whether that's one source of data where you have uh, your advancement database, a single one, or maybe satellite databases that are feeding it, or even in Williams' case, we, we, we get some data from their online, um, online uh, uh, web presence vendor that are, that are also downloaded into, into the single application. Um, and whatever data solution we provide, that platform has to be able to support many concurrent users. So we can't have it suddenly slow down while somebody's running a very expensive job and you've got these volunteers or the vice president trying to walk through his dashboard and see things. Um, and then finally, in terms of these bullets anyway, um, we, we explicitly want our solution to support a variety of tools um, and a variety of applications. So yes, dashboards and however you build the dashboards, yes, static reports that can be v emailed through, uh, sent via email, for example, uh, the use of data visualization or analytic tools. We specifically want the flexibility to be able to use a variety of tools now and in the future. Um, so that's part of the context. More of the context, very practical context, cost and risk. Um, Williams, one of the three schools currently, is a pretty affluent school, but the, it's not an open book, open checkbook in terms of getting things done. But clearly, there are costs that need to be considered. Um, opportunity costs, which I think speak primarily to the use of staff, 
uh, in this case. And, and, and um, so I'm, I'm not going to speak a lot to that right now. We'll do that later. And then also out of pocket, of course, short term and lo long term. So short term capital costs, long term recurring costs associated with the solution clearly need to be considered. If this solution is going to fall outside of um, their uh, ability to pay for it or the ability to justify an expenditure like this, it's just not something that we can practically pursue. So it needs to be considered, or at least you need to understand what the tolerance is in terms of spending money. In addition to that would be risk. So um, this is big, and there are a lot of people involved. So uh, you need to consider whether or not your solution is well implemented and stable, but also whether or not the tools that you selected to implement this with are also stable and long lived. So there's a reluctance on my part anyway to go with things that are um, new, untried, smaller vendors, um, because we're placing a lot of, um, uh, we're placing a lot uh, on, on their shoulders. And uh, if anything were to go wrong, if the technology were no longer attractive because it didn't work out even though it was particularly exciting, or the company didn't make it, we'd be in a relatively big world of hurt. Um, probably our biggest consideration when it comes to cost and risk, though, is personnel related. Um, and so a lot of the objectives, which I'll show in a, in a minute or two about the design of the database, have to do with people, productivity, uh, maintenance, uh, skill set, the development skill set, staff retention, um, staff training. Um, those are the most expensive. Uh, they are the most difficult to deal with. And they can be the most disruptive if, if they don't work out. Um, So one consideration would be, how long does it take to develop a solution like this? Um, so you, know, you want to choose an approach and a tool set that allows you to be most productive, or as productive as you can be. General productivity of your staff, short term and long term, not just building a solution, but being able to use it. And that is one of our primary objectives. Um, in terms of risk, there is also the dependence on a few people for specialized tools and skills. Now, we'll see more of this as we go along, or I'll talk to more of this as we go along. Um, Issues related to turnover recruitment and then cost of time for training. I mean, all these are considerable um, uh, costs, but also risks uh, for whatever uh, approach or solution we take to do this. So we consider what we're trying to do and how, how uh, uh, broad and aggressive our objectives are, as well as our practical constraints uh, in terms of both risk and cost. And so we're making our decisions within the context of you know, the goals, objectives, and cost. Um, ultimately, they're practical trade-offs. Sometimes we don't necessarily choose the most capable product. We choose the product that, on balance, makes the most sense for us. Um, so summarized, again, we have a lot of broad requirements. We need a lot of tools. We want to use the flexibility to use a lot of tools. We've got a lot of users. Um, we didn't talk about this before, but um, uh, needs and, and requirements change. Uh, you go into a campaign, you come out of a campaign. You get staff turnover at a high level. You merge with a medical school, which is what happened at, at Rutgers, and suddenly all the reporting we were doing before needs to be revisited. This just happens over and over again. And um, when we're doing a reporting solution, we need to be prepared to deal with that. Uh, and deal with that quickly and, and um, effectively. Uh, concerns about cost and risks, and then ultimately physical and design uh, requirements with respect to the database, which is what we're talking about here. So in summary, those are the, the contextual issues to consider. Um, I'm only doing this so I keep track of time. Thank you. Um, so. I guess implicit what we're doing is, is, is uh, understanding that we're building a new database. It's the title of the session. Uh, it's, it's on the slides. But you know, let's be clear on why we want a new database. I mean, we could write all sorts of reports against, in Williams' case, or in Rutgers' case, in Oregon's case, against their existing database. Um, and, and in fact, a lot of reports have been written. People have developed. Point solutions and, and other dashboards against those databases. Um, 
But because we're doing such a big thing, I think uh, we concluded that we really need to pull the data out and build an environment that allows us to deal with these issues, which is, again, greater productivity and so forth. So why didn't the older databases work? And I don't need to, be, I don't need to get into this too much with you all, I think, because you're the, an audience, I think, that really appreciates the challenge. But um, generally speaking, the, the, the databases uh, are not necessarily supportive of reporting, per se, or ad hoc queries. Uh, for a variety of reasons. Some of them are physical, some of them are logical. Uh, and some of that is simply a reflection of things that have happened over time that have been done to your data. And so there tends to be a, a huge reliance on, on codes within databases to kind of tell you what's going on. And unfortunately, those codes, reflective of policies, change. And they may change mid-year, they may change over the course of several years. But when you're doing reporting, particularly analytical reporting, which generally requires a look back, how do you equate the way things are coded today with the way they may have been coded five or 10 years ago? You can, but now you need to know not just your business rules and your data structures, but you also need to know the way that your system was implemented, the coding structures and the coding schemes that were used to get your data out there. These are extremely difficult to deal with. Um, and those are the sorts of things we're trying to make go away because we're building this to do many things, but one of those is specifically um, Analytical reporting, whether it's reporting, where we're showing you data and trends, so having to look back and then project forward, so we need to do things apples to apples, or supporting true analysis, where you're going in there with tools or queries and so forth to do things. Either way, uh, we want to make the data as easy to use as possible, because that tends to be the big impediment in moving forward, both for us when we're developing things, as well as for um, the, the, uh, the people at the um, within the reporting organization or the research organizations. So just to step back for a second. So we're talking about developing reports, we're talking about data mining, we're talking about analytics, and generally speaking, um, reporting is done using a variety of, of legacy tools and newer tools. They basically do the same sorts of things and they have to deal with formatting and selection of data. Those are the two basic functions of reporting. Um, some of them make things look prettier than others. They've got power, powerful features or not. But at the end of the day, pretty much all of them have the ability to use SQL to retrieve data. And that's generally because most of your data is stored in relational databases, and that's the interface. Um, this is also generally true with data mining and analysis. And even though those applications might be housed separately, and even though if you might be offloading data, you're still having to extract the data. So you're still having to use SQL and know all about the structures of the data. And then there are the, the, the additional problems of having you know, satellite, um, satellite copies of your data and, and all the uh, issues that we don't like about those. Um, but again, I guess the key point here is that those tools, kind of more of an ad hoc environment versus the reporting, uh, also use SQL. Um, so these are the sorts of issues, again, from a, from a programming and, and staff and, pro and productivity uh, perspective that we're concerned with. Uh, so you need staff that are proficient with SQL itself. That's a given. Um, depending on what tools you're using, you need to be proficient with that tool. So if it's Crystal, if it's, if it's Cognos, if it's reporting services, if it's SPSS, if it's R, you need to know R. Um, so there's an issue. Um, Those can be acquired, they can be trained, or you can be trained on those. Um, more challenging is understanding advancement concepts. So as we're bringing in these people with this expertise or, or training them, we're bringing, bringing in uh, statisticians. Um, we, we need to know your business. We need to know your terminology. Uh, we, and we also need to know how that's reflected in your database. Um, so there's another specific challenge, and, and now we're getting to probably the most uh, uh, important ones. And then again, as I mentioned earlier, even if you do understand your business terms and, your, and, um, and the way they're implemented in the system, um, now you have this additional problem often of having to know how things changed historically. So you don't uh, you know, add up dollars across years and don't realize that in fact you're not, you're not looking at the same sort of information. Um, I will, uh, I'll, probably, I'll probably move on in the interest of time. Um, so 
The first thing we had to do is decide what platform we would use, both in terms of approach as well as product. Um, and I'll jump right to the conclusion here, which is that, well, actually, first of all, um, often when I talk to people about developing a data warehouse, supporting analytics, doing a data mart, I'm immediately asked you know, to use a star, star schema, to use a snowflake, to use multidimensional, what product do you use, et cetera. And the answer is we don't use any of them. Well, actually, that's not quite true. We use them for point solutions. But a reporting database is, um, is a relational database for a variety of reasons. Um, one of those is we are loading full detail from the source database. So we need the ability to have normalized structures, uh, full detail with full normalization, because we want to use that data in the same way that you're able to use it in your operational um, you know, source. Uh, in addition to that, we then add denormalized structures that starts to address our ability to be more productive and need to know a little less, both in terms of physical relationships as well as logical relationships um, in the uh, data structures. Then we also add, uh, and I, I won't necessarily call this a denormalized structure, but we also start to um, create uh, new data structures and new data columns that reflect specific business rules or specific business concepts that weren't there in the source database. Um, they were there inherently because if you combine the right sorts of codes and exceptions, you could come to the same conclusion, but you needed to know how to do that. So, and, and this is something I will show you examples of. So we are adding additional things that reflect your business rules. So you can just talk to the database or refer to information in the database um, by asking, uh, and we'll show this example, does this transaction count or does this dollar count towards my campaign total? That is not necessarily a simple question in most of your databases, um, but very simple concept. Um, we, we occasionally add additional structures to support analytical tasks to make that easier, to make certain things that you would have to program around easier to do. That's different than a business concept. That's more of a uh, facility or, or to uh, make programming easier or make SQL construction easier. And then finally, um, we, this is, so I said it's all relational. That's true. That doesn't mean we don't also use multidimensional or other things, but they are fed from this data. They are serving, they are, they're supporting very specific functions. Um, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but um, basically, by making that a two-step process, extracting data from your source databases, transforming it so that it's easier to use, to get it into um, analysis services, for example, or something else, it, what you've done is eliminated the additional the transform, transformation you've already done to get it into a relational database. In other words, if you were to populate a multidimensional database to support certain types of analytics, you've got to know all about the data structures, you've got to know about the, you got to know about the exceptions, you've got to know about um, your business rules, well, we've already did that to populate the relational database. Now getting it into a different environment, whether it's for Excel or anything else, uh, eliminates a whole lot of, of that complexity. Uh, but that is not ultimately about our database. I just want to point that we do that as well. So what are the primary reasons we use, like, utilize a relational database, again, were the fact that um, we can use SQL. Somehow that doesn't sound like a good thing, but it is because um, that is a language or uh, a technology that, ever, that everyone you hire or everyone you have is likely to know. So in terms of retraining or learning a sometimes very unique and rare or hard to find um, um, new language or a way of interacting with data, um, that, that's kind of off the table. And that, that becomes a big problem. So for example, if you're, if you're familiar with analysis services within um, SQL Server, unless you're using a visual interface, you're having to access that through uh, an interface called MDX. I struggle with it. Um, and um, I, I can't imagine having to rely on that for something of, of, you know, of this scale. Um, because it'd be very difficult to find, train, and retain people with the right skill set to work with that. Um, yes? Um, 
Well, we could use the multi-dimensional multi database so from a, a one of a variety of vendors, um, including you know, we tend to focus on Microsoft, so analysis services. Um, but it was, for various reasons, that was both limiting as well as uh, risky and more expensive. Um, which speaks to cost, which is that um, some of these products are pretty expensive um, to acquire, and then also the cost to deploy it. Um, um, and, and by the way, we're not necessarily limited to uh, multidimensional solutions here. It could be any of a number of solutions that help you develop dashboards or, or do reporting that uh, kind of have their own environments. Um, but more important, and I've said this all along, I'm more concerned about the cost of personnel, short-term and long-term, cost and risk of personnel in terms of, uh, of um, determining, of deciding to use a relational database rather than something else. And then, and then there's risk as well. Um, We didn't do a whole lot of work here. I mean, we basically considered Oracle and SQL Server. We're talking about relational database. Um, Williams is already an Oracle user, so that would seem to point towards Oracle because it's already licensed. Their staff are familiar with PL SQL. Um, they've got other tools that use it. Um, frankly, as we compared Oracle and SQL Server, I'm, I'm a much greater fan of Oracle's PL SQL than I am of T-SQL, so I really, they're, they're, at least their SQL, their programming environment is much stronger, in my opinion. Uh, but well, that's not what we chose. We chose SQL Server. And we chose SQL Server because of the bigger picture. And the bigger picture was the fact that bundled with SQL Server was uh, a very good ETL tool, which can get very expensive if you have to buy those separately, um, a very good reporting tool, and a multi-dimensional um, database tool or environment as well, all bundled with SQL Server. Uh, if you were to go off and have to do these piecemeal, it could get extremely expensive. So th that was it. Ultimately, it was that last bullet, though, which is that reporting services is, is a very good reporting tool, but there were no deployment costs beyond having to, uh, you know, unless you wanted to scale it out to with a lot of users to additional server. There were no per user deployment costs. And if you recall, I don't know if I have that slide, I don't, but we've got, depending on how you count them, over 25,000 users to worry about. And we're trying to do a lot for them. So that becomes, undo you, you can't do it for 25,000 if you're having to worry about um, per user licensing, even per server licensing, it would get crazy with some of the other solutions relative to basically free. So uh, ultimately, and Mike, you can speak up if you think there was more to it, but that pretty much uh, uh, made the decision for us. And then, you know what? That had nothing to do with the capability of the backend database. It was just, a, just you know, the, the database was good enough. It was strong enough. It was the complete picture that really led us to select that as the platform on which to base the work that we did. Okay, so again, uh, I just kind of summarized the database product selection um, um, issues or considerations. Um, comparing Oracle to SQL, I mean, from our, for, for our purposes and the size of data and our transaction volume or our reporting volume, from, from forms perspective, they were basically equivalent, didn't matter. Um, indeed, the programming environment within Oracle was stronger, but that doesn't matter because the programming environment within SQL, SQL Server is, is plenty good. Um, Single vendor support and integration of these other tools was a pretty big deal. Um, the, the, the integration of their ETL tool with the database and these other, other environments, both analysis services as well as reporting, is very strong. And that was a big plus. And then ultimately, as I said, it was, it was really all about, at the end of the day, it was the cost related to deploying reports, which then implicitly meant we've selected reporting services as our reporting tool. Um, which we're not talking about selection of reporting tools, but basically the same sort of considerations. There are plenty of reporting tools that have nicer, more powerful, easier to use facilities. But reporting service is not a bad tool, it's a good tool, maybe not as strong at certain things as other tools. Good enough, and then from an overall cost perspective, supportability and integration, uh, an, an easy answer for us. 
Okay, so that, that dealt with bullet number two. So context, why we're making this, the, the, the context in which we're making these decisions, uh, our general selection of, of technology and architecture and product to do what we're doing, and now I'm gonna talk a little bit about some specific things in the way we implement the database to address some of the concerns and, and, and considerations that I highlighted earlier. Um, so these objectives are both objectives as we're developing all of this as well as long-term objectives and objectives for uh, Williams and Rutgers and, and, and Oregon and other schools, which is that um, we are concerned about the productivity of the limited number of staff that are providing reports to the entire college university or advancement um, um, team. Um, essentially, we want you to be more productive, which means you can be more responsive to new requests. We want us to be more respective, uh, productive so we can spit out more and more quickly. Um, we want to be able to enable, we want to enable the use of all these analytical tools so you don't have this big overhead or the burden of getting this expensive, um, highly qualified analyst to use these really powerful tools to have to figure out how to get the data or work with somebody else how to get the data in the right format to use and interpret in the first place. And that becomes, a, I think, a significant obstacle in moving forward for analytical purposes. And we wanted to have a really good long and short-term flexibility in our choice of tools. So um, these are our objectives as we design the database. So that goes beyond selection of, or you know, uh, relational versus other, it goes into our implementation. So again, I'll go through this quickly. So what we have are both normalized and denormalized structure. We've got business concepts implemented in the data. Um, and then more specifically, um, we've got the fourth bullet, which speaks to a reduction in the reuse of, you know, I'll, I'll just go into the next slide because they start to get there. Um, in terms of general principles in both reporting as well as the database design. Um, there are a couple of high level general principles that, we're, that we follow that pretty much do most of what we're trying to accomplish. Um, we want to avoid the use of hard coded values. We want to avoid having to have complex business rules known, understood, and implemented in reports and SQL queries or any other kind of queries. We want to avoid any kind of complex SQL code to perform tasks. Um, and you notice we use terms like avoid, minimize, maximize, not forbid, not eliminate, because again, we're making practical uh, trade-offs and decisions here. Uh, we know that doesn't always work. If we can make a significant impact in terms of productivity or reduction of effort, we're really doing what we want to do. Uh, we're not trying to shoot for 100%. And there are times when you are just going to tick somebody off or maybe inhibit somebody's productivity by saying, sorry, you can't use hard-coded values. Well, now what do I do? Because you haven't given me any support in the database to do this new thing. So, you know, these are, these are practical things. However, um, we do have another principle in terms of the overall long-term uh, uh, maintenance or design, a refinement of the database, which is that you know, we recognize that you'll do those sorts of things, but uh, we want to go back periodically, identify where either new business requirements or things that we missed are driving you to start to use some business rules implemented in your reports, maybe with greater, trickier stuff than we're comfortable with, and maybe some hard-coded values. And go back, change the database, or enhance the database to support those things to the extent that we can practically, uh, and then go back and change those reports to simplify them so we don't create a long-term maintenance problem because of these islands of redundant, difficult code. So that is part of the whole trick, which is not simply this one in design this fancy database, but periodic revision. And that they're gonna happen because your business requirements change. New business rules crop up. Business rules change. The reports have to change to accommodate that. Uh, we really want the database to change to accommodate that, but that doesn't necessarily happen on the same day. Um, okay, so um, again, in the interest of time, I can only talk about so much. So what we're going to talk about a little bit are the use of what we call indicators and the use of views. Now, 
I don't know if you're going to see anything particularly innovative here. I mean, these are things I've known about for 30 years and probably have used for 30 years in different ways, and so have lots of other people. We're just doing them, and we're doing them consistently here. Um, so let's start with um, indicators. Again, uh, um, one of the rules is that we really don't want anybody that writes reports or queries to use hard-coded values because that can get you into a lot of trouble in the long run. For, and, and you probably know, right? I mean, if you add a new code to the database, you gotta find every reference to this string of codes in every query and change it. That's something to be avoided. Now, you could say that we know this and we're good about this, but I, I can't tell you how many, can't tell you how much code I've seen where there, and even as recently as yesterday, where I got this big package of code with redundant references throughout of the same string of values. And that's only one report. This, by the way, was a package of 8,000 lines of PL SQL code. I mean, totally common, because I see it all the time, but totally not what you want, right? So it just seems so obvious, but it's so common. You just don't want this to happen. So what are we gonna do to make this go away? So th this is uh, this little, chunk of SQL here in Courier is a, a very simple example where it's looking at the way you've categorized people and saying, you know, I only want people. Now, your database, and frankly, many, you don't necessarily need to do this this way, but then again, I do see this. You only want people out of all the types of whatever you call them, constituents, records, donors, entities, whatever is in your database. Um, and you wind up having to, because you may not have it, look through a list like this. So lots of things can go wrong. You can misspell it. You can get the wrong codes in there. You can miss some codes, et cetera. So how do we avoid this? Um, I, I don't know how well you can read it from the back particularly, but there is essentially the same SQL code or piece of it up front. Basically what we do is we've added, this is very simple, but I'm just demonstrating a concept. We've added a column to the database called person type indicator. In other words, if I frequently want to know and select on people versus foundations versus corporations, don't make me go through a list. Simply let me get this sim simple Boolean value that tells me, yes, it's a person. And so I simply select on whether or not the person type is one or true, and I get my people. And then if you wind up having to add another code to your list of codes in your database, um, your reports, something has to worry about that, by the way, but your reports don't have to worry about that. That's the, that's the general principle and the general use behind indicators. Here's the one that's a little more complicated. Uh, again, I don't know how well you can see it, but we've got a very simple snippet of SQL up there that replaces anywhere, okay, so I don't mean to pick on individual schools, so I won't name them, but um, this SQL replaces pages literally, of, of Oracle SQL that I've replaced in a couple of places, literally pages, with lots of hard-coded values and lots of joins and all sorts of things. You don't want this, or you don't want that. Um, so we simply say, so what this is saying is, I've got an indicator database that says, this is the example I, I mentioned earlier, should I count this transaction, whatever it is, is it a pledge, is it a pledge payment? Is it a matching gift? Is it an outright gift? Is it a deferred gift? Is, should I count this towards my campaign total? Don't make me think about it. Yes or no, I count it towards my campaign total. Um, I, I'll go ahead and do it. I, was, I wasn't going to, but so for example, uh, you may count matching gifts, yes or no. You may count outright gifts. You may count pledges. Um, you don't want to count pledge payments because you would be double counting if you counted pledges. Except, if that pledge was made on an annual fund pledge that was made prior to the start of campaign, in which case you're gonna count those pledge payments if they have the right campaign code. <laughs> and they're not deferred. And this is why you wind up with pages of, pages of SQL to deal with all these exceptions, which frankly then change. And then every year or so, they go in and tweak it a bit more because they, the, the, the rules evolve. And in fact, at this school, which will remain nameless, and there's nothing wrong with this, uh, 
within the last two years, a year and a half, they changed some of their county rules midway through campaign to say, we're going to start county bequest intentions because our peers are, but we never did before. So now they had to go back and find all of their campaign reports and other queries. And, and, and the exclusion that took out bequest intentions now needed to be put back in. That was difficult. Um, so uh, that's how you wind up with tons of code and tons of risk. And, and, and so the use of indicators for something like this, and this is, this is probably the most valuable and common one, but there are lots of these, um, is how that's implemented. So not terribly innovative, right? But um, you, I think you have to have the, the discipline to do this. Um, so the use of indicators. You notice I was using ones and zeros. So SQL Server doesn't have a native Boolean data type. So there was no true and false to be used in SQL Server. And if they'd had it, I'm not sure I would have used it anyway, because we're using basically a tiny integer or an, or an integer, ones and zeros, and because there are all, all sorts of ancillary benefits to doing that. Um, it's somewhat more efficient to evaluate somewhat less prone to typing errors versus, for example, Y's and little Y's and N's or whatever. Um, but it allows you to do certain other things that um, can make uh, processing of uh, large uh, quantities of data much more efficient and also lends itself to simplifying the SQL if you're doing multiple, if you're doing multiple calculations simultaneously against a single data set. It can help avoid having to go through that data set more than once and having a lot of repetitive SQL. Here's an example. This is, okay, this may be hard to read. Um, so this is the technical deep dive part, right? So you need to know SQL a little bit. But what I'm doing here is I'm running through the set of donations where they count as fund, uh, where they can be counted towards the, our fundraising totals for fiscal year two, uh, greater than or equal to 2009. And I am counting the number of pledges. I am counting the pledge total. I'm counting the number of outright gifts. I'm counting the outright gift total, et cetera, et cetera. I'm also, in this case, counting credit card payments. And I'm doing it two different ways, just to demonstrate the use of this concept. In one case, I'm using a case statement. So when credit card indicator equals one, when it's a credit card payment, then, um, then count, then add a one. Otherwise, add a zero. Might have noticed, by the way, I'm doing no counts either. Because you're using ones and zeros, you can sum them. You can multiply them. And so in this case, I'm counting in a different way the number of credit card payments by multiplying the credit card indicator, a one or a zero, times um, um, whether or not it's a, it, it, it's a payment. Did that five minutes? OK, so I got to talk faster. Anyway, th there are lots of different tricks like this. Um, but that's why we're using ones and zeros. So, I, so when it comes to having a trick that you can use yourself, even a small reporting table, this is something you might want to consider if you're not doing it already. Um, I have five minutes, so I'll talk fast, and I probably won't get to some of the ETL stuff. By the way, the presentation has been submitted, so you should be able to download it at some point. Um, and I, I tried to in my slides to, so you should be able to follow it pretty much from the bullets. So they tend to be a little dense, but you can probably follow through, follow, follow along. Uh, second, our use of views. First rule, if you're writing a report, you may not reference a, a base table. You may not reference an actual table. You must use a view. That's, that's our reporting rule. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, did I even say it up here? Um, well, that's our rule. You must use a view. So there are some trade-offs. Uh, there are a bunch of reasons why that's valuable. I'm going, to show you another, I'm going to show you one of the reasons in a second. Some of them have to do with the ETL. Um, one of the primary benefits is that we can make some of these adjustments that I mentioned earlier about changing business rules quickly without changing the ETL, without changing underlying data structures, but as far as what the reports and see, having that be transparent to them very quickly implemented. That's one of the benefits of use inherently, right? Um, on the other hand, we, we lose some things from that. Um, there, there may be some performance issues. Well, that's up, your, up to your DBAs to make sure they don't introduce performance issues when they're enhancing views, but that's, there's a potential. Um, and the other one that is a little bit annoying is that a lot of your query tools like to show you the relations, relationships between tables, and they depend on foreign key references. 
most of them cannot look into the view and find and interpret the foreign key references, and so you lose, you lose these, this visual clue in a lot of query tools. And that's a bit of a nuisance. Uh, on the other hand, once you're experienced using your database, that it's, it's more of a beginner issue, but uh, that's, well, that's one of the trade-offs. Um, some of the views are as simple as simply mapping every single column from the table. Sometimes we don't care. Other ones, as in this case, are a little more involved. So this is using a bunch of indicators to calculate a single value, which is, well, that fundraising donation indicator that I mentioned earlier. It's looking at, is it an outright gift, is it a matching payment, uh, et cetera. Um, this is the SQL that uses it. Um, this is the query that built it. So why is it in there in the view? It's in there in the view because this was recently introduced. Um, this was a new requirement that was introduced at Rutgers. Um, and it gets to, for example, um, the, the introduction of bequest intentions. Um, and it's temporary because their campaign ends in about nine months. Um, and then the rule's gonna change again. And so you really worry, do you wanna invest in changing your ETL and all the overhead only to have to go back and, and know and you have to revisit it again in about nine months. Uh, the other reason is, um, in many cases, we have a new rule. We want to we work with it before we memorialize it or before we put in all the effort into, into hard coding around it and, and, and building the ETL around it and changing the database structures. Um, and so um, that can be pretty much uh, uh, hidden from sight from anybody, but implemented through the use of the views this way. Um, so again, in summary, in the interest of time, I won't go through the summary. In summary, this is what I said. Um, so quickly to the ETL. Um, none of the complex code goes away. None of the complex issues go away. None of the business rules go away. What you've done, though, is tried to take them out of one, 10, 100 different reports and queries and bring them down into one place. So that is good from a maintenance perspective, but it introduces greater risk from in terms of whether you did that properly, because if you break that one place, you've broken 100 reports. If you slow down that structure and the ability to support that, you've slowed down 100 reports in the entire environment, not a single report. So, um, so the, the risk has shifted from individual reports, from inconsistency across reports, to having a really strong um, uh, and disciplined maintenance of your ETL programming. It's no more or less difficult in terms of programming than it was before. Actually, it's less difficult because we have more pieces to work with, uh, but you're just bringing it into one place. Um, in the interest of time, again, I'm going to go forward very quickly. Um, this is a general diagram of the ETL, sucking data out of the source tables, putting them in the staging tables, moving them to another platform, SQL Server, transforming them further, loading them into our actual tables, and then the stuff that's in a dotted line is uh, perhaps then you have secondary moves, in this case, to analysis services for multidimensional support. Um, we use integration services to manage this, which is an ETL tool. So with respect to practical trade-offs, we really limit our use of integration services basically to uh, supporting authentication, encrypting passwords and connection information uh, between uh, databases, for example for scheduling, for workflow, for error handling, but not for SQL, and not for transformations. Even though those capabilities exist, they're built into this tool, and some of them are pretty neat, now you've introduced another technology, somebody else needs to know something specific, and furthermore, a lot of those things you're doing anyway, because on the source database side, you've got all this PL SQL code, if you're Oracle or SQL code or whatever, that already has all the business rules in it. So, you know, our decision was, look, we'll just, implement a lot of those business rules in SQL code, SQL scripts, PL SQL scripts, on the source database side, which is close to the source data and close to all the code that already exists that does this stuff. And we just have integration services invoke those SQL scripts. And that is also true in the load side where we don't try to have all sorts of fancy transformations used by the ETL tool. Not that it's not capable, but um, terms of your skill set and your staff and your ability to support it, you are more likely to, to be able to support the more challenging and important part of all of this, 
using a tool and environment you already know than have to introduce another whole fancy uh, tool set um, that will, uh, frankly, is difficult to use with, to use. And, and actually, and then a final point relative to that, I find that tuning SQL and writing very efficient SQL code is a lot easier than working with these ETL tools, which tend to have a more uh, abstract and, and less tunable, less generally efficient way of doing things. Um, I apologize for <coughs> being slow, so I'm just gonna get to my ultimate conclusions. Um, which is a summary of what we just said. Uh, um, if you're going to do something like this, as we have, you know, I, I say plan for success, but if you're going to be successful, then people are going to rely on it, and they're going to rely on it more. Now, having done this well, having it be very maintainable and stable becomes very important. If you do something like this and didn't use good techniques, and people start to depend upon it, and this is what you see with satellite applications, for example, right? Or even Excel spreadsheets, people start to depend on data from this source. If you didn't have the rigor in implementing that, then you've got yourself a long-term maintenance problem. Um, so um, be prepared for changing needs, be prepared for changing data, be prepared for changing technology. You know, you, suddenly you're surprised. It's been three years since we did this and we're still using and depending on it, but oh, that vendor is no longer supporting that version of that product. And, how do I get it to the next level? Oh, and by the way, the programmer that wrote this left. Um, uh, and ultimately, so in our decisions, in, the, in our primary considerations in our decisions, pretty much in this order, the decisions we've made about the technology, the approach, and, and the techniques were driven primarily by staff availability, staff costs, productivity, um, retention, et cetera, sort of issues. Single most important issue. Second were dollar costs in terms of costs of technology and deployment related costs. Um, and then uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure I'd put this third in terms of importance, but uh, additionally, um, our, our choices had a lot to do with uh, knowing this is a long term thing. There are a, a lot of use of this information. So we wanted to make sure that we could employ new additional technologies and tools to work with this information, that we weren't completely relied on a single vendor, on a single solution, on a single approach to doing things. Hence the solution, or the decision to go with relational structures, to go with SQL. Um, and then finally, probably the most important thing is to, to, uh, ex ex exerting a, a degree of discipline in your programming, in your, in your database design, in your ETL work, and in your documentation. In fact, documentation becomes extremely important You've got this very, well, it should be anyway, but you've got, you know, you've got this very important ETL process. Um, it houses essentially your business rules. Um, doing a good job documenting that for long-term maintenance becomes very important. So in terms of discipline, I think discipline in terms of the way you do reporting, the way you maintain your database, so you can continue to benefit from these approaches. And then and doing a, a good job documenting things are probably uh, ongoing among the more important issues. So I apologize for the speed. 15 minutes is short. Um, if you've got any questions, I can try to answer them now, but it's probably not fair. Two questions in the foyer, but let's all thank Michael. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll be happy to talk to you offline or off to, off to the side.